The Second World War was unquestionably one of the darkest moments in human history. The sheer scale of death and destruction, not to mention the Holocaust, can often be difficult to even fathom. However, standing in sharp contrast to this is the story of the French Resistance. After the Nazis occupied France, thousands of men and women would risk their lives resisting German occupation. Indeed, the resistance has become one of the most enduring images of the Second World War and has inspired countless films and books. The actual history, however, was far removed from the romantic stories often portrayed in films. Members of the French resistance were every bit as courageous as the fictional characters they inspired, but their lives were far from glamorous. They lived in constant fear of being caught and wondered if the people they worked with were in fact German agents. If they were apprehended, they faced awful choices. They could either inform on their comrades or suffer torture, execution, or arguably an even worse fate, death in a concentration camp. The courage of these people was awe-inspiring. Now, until recently, Irish involvement in the French resistance was largely unknown. But through his intensive research, Dr. David Murphy in Maynooth University has uncovered scores of Irish people who opposed the Nazis, including some who paid the ultimate price. Now, earlier this week, I interviewed David in what was a fascinating conversation about Irish people who served in the French Resistance. We spoke for about an hour, and when I sat down to edit the interview, it quickly became apparent there was actually two stories in our conversation. So the first is the wider story of Irish involvement in the French Resistance, and then a second story within this starts to emerge, that of Irish women who fought in the Resistance, who have been completely forgotten. So, I've split the interview in two, and in this episode, we will look at the Irish community in France on the eve of the Nazi invasion, how the French resistance emerged, and then how Irish people got involved. And then next week, we'll explore the story of the Irish women involved in the French resistance, because that's worth an episode of its own. Now, given I'm already nearly into the episode itself, I'd better introduce myself for new listeners. My name is Finn DeWire, and this is the Irish History Podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to the show to get next week's episode. And before I begin, I want to let you know about a different history series that I'm currently working on at the moment that I need your input for. So it's a history of podcasting. And I've interviewed some of the biggest names in podcasting, people you'll know like Blind Boy and Jennifer Ford and Sam Bungie, who made West Cork. But I need your input as listeners to podcasts because, well, you're part of the history. It's for you these shows are made after all. I've included links in the show notes below to a survey that I've made. It'll just take you a minute, at most maybe two, to fill out. But the results are going to be really important in terms of shaping that series on the history of podcasting. So make sure and have your say. You'll find that survey at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash listener survey. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash listener survey. I have the link in the show notes below. Finally, today's guest is, as I mentioned, Dr. David Murphy. David works in the Centre for Military History and Strategic Studies in the Department of History in Maynooth University. I would like to really thank David for his time in what was, as you're about to hear, a fascinating interview. Sound on the show was by Kate Dunlee. Now, to start the story of Irish involvement in the French Resistance, we need to begin with an overview of the early phase of the Second World War in France. Although the conflict officially began in Europe in September 1939, during the opening months of the war, the major battlefields were all in Eastern Europe. Poland was dismembered by the Nazis and the Soviet Union in late 1939, and it was only in May 1940 that the war would come to France. David now begins by giving an overview of the Nazi attack and occupation of France that gave rise to the French resistance. The the sequence, I think, from the Irish context that got these people caught, so to speak, in occupied France is interesting because the, the war breaks out. We have the invasion of Poland in September of 1939. And at that point, then Britain and France are at war with Germany. So and obviously Poland as well. And Russia will then, and that's significant as well, Soviet Russia will later kind of come in on initially in cooperation with Germany and Poland. That's significant too. But for Britain and France, they're at war with Germany. And what actually happens from September 39, Poland is lost. 
we get into this, what's known as the phony war, are sometimes referred to as Sitzkrieg, because everybody's sitting around, it's Sitzkrieg. And the British and the French armies kind of like fortify themselves there, but there's not a huge amount of activity. Belgium is actually trying to stay neutral, and there's a whole question about should Britain and France actually put troops into Belgium or whatever else. But there's literally nothing happening for months. And then in kind of May, June, Blitzkrieg is launched through Belgium, into France, and we have very, quite catastrophically, we see the, the French and the British army collapse, and we're all aware of the Dunkirk evacuations. That's where it goes. So by July of 1940, France is essentially out of the war. A chunk of the French army, about 100,000 of the French army, and everything that could survive of the British army has been evacuated through Dunkirk. And the Netherlands, Belgium, France is totally occupied. The speed of the Nazi conquest of France shocked many. Most were caught unawares, leaving Irish people in the country with no time to escape. When you look at the generals on both the British and the French side, they were expecting another World War I type of situation that it would all develop very, very slowly in method, you know, kind of like methodological warfare and so on and so forth. But then they're just run through by the German Blitzkrieg and it's all over. Now, for the Irish population, I mean, De Valera at the time actually asks what was then our Department of External Affairs. It, was, it wasn't for, it was called External Affairs. The, they, make the, they ask the question, how many people are actually caught on the far side in France? And they reckon they come back with a, an estimate that between seven and 800 Irish people have been caught in France alone. In the immediate aftermath of the Nazi onslaught, French society was in a state of shock. I asked David about the emergence of the resistance and when this started. He explained that people began to resist in a myriad of ways almost immediately, but his answer here is fascinating in lots of ways though, and is key to understanding the involvement of Irish people. So stereotypes of the French resistance conjure up images of ambushes and attacks on Nazi soldiers. And while this was part of it, as David explains in this answer about the origins of the resistance, it also involved large amounts of non-combat work, intelligence gathering, aiding soldiers caught behind the lines. Basically, the less glamorous, but essential roles. It it emerges actually almost immediately. Uh, I mean, so you have this kind of like phase in 1940 and emerges almost almost immediately. And it's various, it's low-key things. It is unorganized, generally unorganized. It is people acting by themselves or maybe acting in small kind of like community groups. And it is everything from, say, passive resistance, just not doing what they're told, kind of like if they're in industry, sabotage in, the, in their workplace, if they can sabotage German vehicles, this kind of low-key kind of stuff. And then it often as well focuses around there being a whole load of French and British servicemen left behind. And then you've got a certain amount of them being shot down when they're else. So getting those people and organising escape lines to get them back to the UK, essentially. That is a very early activity, and you see people involved in that straight away from the get-go. There's one particular Irish nun, Catherine McCarthy, and she is involved in, in a hospital around Bethune. And basically what she does is get people, French and British soldiers, out of the hospital, into an invasion line to get them out. Okay, and now that's very early for her. She's doing that from 1940. And quite often as well, I mean, people who are involved in the early phase of resistance activity are usually not around in 1944-45. They're usually caught somewhere along the way. She's caught in 1941 and she ends up in a concentration camp. Yeah, it's Catherine McCarthy, Catherine Ann McCarthy from Cork. And then there's different kind of groupings within the resistance. It's not a kind of homogenous whole. There are, say, there are communist resistance groups, okay? And until Germany goes into Russia in 1941, they are actually directed from Moscow to do nothing, okay? To actually not get involved in the war. That is actually Soviet party policy. So they don't get people involved until post-41. And then you've got a group that kind of like grows up in around the army, okay? Like former army people. And then there are other peculiar, like to say, Polish exiles, Polish expats who organize their own. And there's an Irish woman like involved in one of those Polish, Polish groups. And then it becomes more and more organized. 1942, we start moving towards a formal kind of like FFL, kind of Force France Lieb kind of idea where there's a collective brain running all of the resistance activity that, that is linked up better to communications to London to the free French government that's in exile in London under de Gaulle. But the simple question is, from the get-go, from the summer of 40, people are doing this, and then it gets more and more organised. 
and then there's more and more equipment and cooperation from kind of like from the from the the UK through say French government in exile, Belgian government in exile, sending over people, sending over equipment, using uh, British army equipment, using the RAF, that kind of idea. Okay, so we have a sense of the Nazi occupation of France and the emergence of the resistance. But given the focus of the episode, I asked David about the wider Irish community in France at the outset of the war. How big was it? Where did they live? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, it's a, it's a mix, which is quite interesting when you go through. So you say about seven or eight hundred Irish people. A lot of those are congregated in around Paris, and the rest of them you'll find them all over the country. It's it's kind of like from you know northern France all the way down to Marseille, some kind of obscure uh, rural areas. You find them all over the country. But there are a couple of subtypes in amongst this. You've got a couple of soldiers, ex-British Army soldiers, who have stayed behind, married French women post World War One. And they're actually working in the cemeteries, like tending. I mean, when you think of that's kind of a macabre cycle that they're tending their former kind of like comrades in the cemeteries. And there's a couple of Irish guys involved in that who would get involved in the resistance. They tend to be more rural. There are a couple of nuns there who are working in religious orders as predominantly as nurses. So there's a couple of nuns there as well. And then when you look at everybody else, it's it's an odd mixture of people. There's a chap called Robert Armstrong. It was from Edwardstown. He's been involved in the cemetery work. You've got a you've got a guy called William Cunningham who's from Dublin. He has been working as a journalist, and then in 1938 he joins the Foreign Legion, and he ends up in the first stage of the war is evacuated through Dunkirk, and then ends up being parachuted back into France. So he has this peculiar route. But I think the thing that identifies them, if you look at them, particularly the women, I think they're people who've left Ireland, a very conservative Ireland at that time to kind of go and live a more expressive, freer life in, in France and in Paris in particular. People like Janie McCarthy, again, she's very, very prominent in one of these evasion lines, operates a safe house. She's gone, she's working as a, as a language teacher. But quite often, I, I mean, what would you describe? There are working class people in amongst them. I mean, one of the people is a plumber's daughter. There's, there's another guy who's a mechanic, a guy called Sam Murphy from Belfast. No relation, not as far as I know anyway, but he's, from, he's a mechanic from Belfast. David went on to explain how many of these people moved to France to escape the deeply conservative society in the Irish Free State in the 20s and 30s. I think what, what's attracting them to Paris and France is that sense of a bit more a, a bit more freedom, a bit more liberality, you know, and then I suppose the best known Irish resistor obviously is Samuel Beckett. He's a fine example of somebody who finds Ireland of the 20s, Ireland of the 30s, a bit of a restrictive, conservative place, and he goes to live a different life and also express himself artistically in Paris. So I think that that sense of freedom, of getting away, having your own life as an independent man or as an independent, particularly the women, as a more independent woman in France is, is what's driving them, you know? David mentioned earlier that divisions in French politics before the war played a role in shaping the resistance. So before we chatted about Irish resistors, I wanted to know how these political divisions mapped onto the Irish community. Where did Irish people position themselves in French politics? Were they happy with the status quo in France? Or did they orientate themselves towards the left, who demanded major social, political and economic changes? They tend to be, I mean, you'd have to say, they tend to be more of a conservative kind of group. French political right, they would be of the centre, maybe of the centre right. There's one particular guy, William O'Connor, one particular guy who's involved with a group, Vaudenor. Vaudenor is a leftist group, is a communist-leaning group. But he's the only one I've, I've identified as being of that, that tinge at the moment. Next, we moved on to discuss life under Nazi occupation in France. When the Nazis invaded, they began to target sections of the French population in line with their racial doctrines. Jews and the Roma community were rounded up. The Drancy detention centre outside Paris would become a notorious holding centre from where thousands of Jews were shipped to the Auschwitz concentration camp. I asked David what, if anything, the Nazis thought about the Irish community. Were they of any particular interest? Now I found his answer here really interesting because David explains how the partition of Ireland in 1920 played a role. So if a person was from Northern Ireland, they were considered a citizen of the United Kingdom, which was at war with Germany, while the Free State was neutral. 
Some of these are from the, 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 the six counties, so they're technically still British subjects, and there's a certain amount of attention paid to them. But the people who are from kind of like era, free state era, are technically neutral, so they get special status. And there's quite a bit of conversation between Dublin and Paris wanting to know what's happening with its people. There are, there are queries coming in. You can follow the paper trail and the surviving France. Families come in and say, look, you know, you know, my, my son, my cousin or whatever is in France. We haven't heard anything from them for a certain amount of time. And external affairs will then put in the query. It would seem in generally the, the Irish citizens are generally seem to be left alone, seem to be left alone because of the neutral status. In some cases, though, I mean, there's, there's, there's one, you know, they will when they are caught for, if they are caught for resistance activity, and some of them are, they are just treated like everybody else. It's, it's concentration camp time, or it's deported, or it's execution, and that happens. That happens. Next, we moved on to discuss individual Irish people who fought in the resistance. But before we get into those stories, I just want to give you a quick reminder to fill out that survey about the upcoming series on the history of podcasting. It's completely anonymous and the questions are straightforward, asking things like how long you've been listening to podcasts, what your favourite shows are, that kind of thing. You can find the survey at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash listener survey. I have a link to that in the show notes. It's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash listener survey. Next, we moved on to discuss the Irish people who fought in the resistance. The most famous of these is the writer Samuel Beckett. David gave an overview of Beckett's life and his involvement in the resistance. He's Dublin born. He's born in Dublin around 1906. And he will later go on to become this great literary figure of the 20th century. He is somebody that I think finds, in terms of his artistic expression, in, in the 1920s, finds Dublin, finds Ireland a very small place. He's associated, he does some work in around Trinity um, and um, Trinity College, etc. But by mid-1930s, he's living in France. He is still in Paris when the Germans occupy. There's a friend of his, a guy called Alfred Perron, who, oddly enough, had also worked in Dublin as a language teacher, and they knew each other from that period, who sets up a resistance unit called Gloria SMH. Gloria SMH is an interesting unit in terms that it's basically its job is to get intelligence on German naval movements on the West Coast, okay, the West Coast, move that through the rail system to Paris, and then it is basically, material is photographed and sent to London. Okay, Beckett's role in this is as a courier. He is essentially carrying material from Peron and other individuals to the photographer to get basically photographed into a microdot and then tra- transmitted from that. And his wife also does this as, as sometimes on occasion. So it is actually a very dodgy line of work. Apparently his method for this was to hide the stuff in plain sight, that he would actually have the material mixed in with his own manuscripts. He would carry it in a bag mixed in with his own material so that if he is stopped and searched, they would get a load of paper, but they may not see the incriminating stuff in, in amongst this. You know, I suppose if he's carrying around a copy of, you know, one of his more obscure plays, <laughs> they may not spot that this intelligence material in that. Beckett's experience underscored the risks involved in being a member of the French Resistance. The group he worked for, Gloria, SMH, was eventually infiltrated by an informer, the Catholic priest, Father Robert Alish, who was working for the Germans. As he began to pass information to his handlers, arrests began. Beckett and his wife, Suzanne de Chevaux du Menil, came to the attention of the Gestapo, and it was only quick thinking on her part that saved the couple. And that whole organization is, is blown in, I think, 1942. It is actually, it is blown from the inside. And when Beckett goes back to his flat, his wife is waiting for him to tell him there's Gestapo waiting to, to arrest him. She's actually gone up to the flat and keyed herself in and convinced him that she's a neighbor coming in to, to meet, you know, to, to do something. And she's gotten out. So the two of them disappeared. You go down to the Vichy zone, which at that stage is still being administered by the Vichy government up until 1943. That status remains. And they basically go into hiding in, in, kind of in rural France until the war is over. And then when he comes back, he will get involved in a Red Cross hospital up in San Lo in Normandy. And people are probably aware of that as well. That that's another significant wartime service. He is high profile in this dangerous work. It was fascinating. I, I got his card in, in the French archives. You get this kind of, it's, it's less than an A4 sheet. It's one of these fiches and it has his details on it. And he signed this as well. And you're kind of saying, you know, how much could I sell this in that fiction? <laughs> Which is probably a bad thing for a historian when holding historical documents. But it's, it's a minimalist account 
then you have to dig into other sources to find out what he was doing. But I think it's so typical of Beckett that he did this. He never really spoke about it. He gets to Croix de Guerre. He gets on the citation for the Croix de Guerre. says that he carried out his duties to the limits of audacity, which kind of suggests he was doing something a bit risky. But he never speaks about it. He never writes about it. The actual official files on him in France are very, very minimalist. And maybe that's typical of the guy. It's typical of Beckett, as we as we know him. If we've, I'm sure a lot of us have experienced waiting for God at some stage in our life. And it's, you know, it's very much in that style. Another figure David has uncovered in his research is William Cunningham. This guy lived an extraordinary life in the early years of the conflict before then vanishing. David now picks up his story. He's in my head. You know, this is a, this is the problem when a lot of these people, you get a file, you get a, a kind of like an idea of their wartime activity, and then it just stops. Okay, it just stops. You're kind of like groping around trying to find out what are they doing with themselves after the war. And sometimes you have to, you know, kind of really work to find out when they died and where they're buried and that kind of stuff. William Cunningham is the guy we mentioned earlier on. He's living in France, uh, living in Paris in the 30s. He joins the Foreign Legion. He's involved in the initial stage of fighting in France. He's evacuated out of Dunkirk and then still associated with the Free French Forces now based in London. He volunteers to come back into France with SOE. Okay, so he trains up for SOE. He uses an interesting, an interesting pseudonym as alias is Paul de Bono. Paul de Bono is his surname. And he gets involved and in, he gets parachutes into France in 1943 gets involved in a, in a kind of like a sabotage operation that kind of goes wrong, somehow gets back to London. And I can place him in a particular office in London in 1943. Then he just drops off my radar totally. So, and it's just, he still bangs around in the inside of my head. I can't find him. He, he doesn't show up in any of the French records. And I went into some of their intelligence stuff and he doesn't really show up in those either. So I just, just would like to know what became of him after that. William Cunningham, if anyone's listening, and knows of Dublin born, lived in France, all of that kind of stuff. And he basically has a debrief, a London office, an SOE office in 1943, walks out of that office, and I don't know what happens to him after that. So far, we have heard accounts of just two members of the French resistance. In next week's episode, we're going to be talking about the Irish women who served and their stories, some of which have more tragic ends. But to finish this first episode, I asked David, why aren't the Irish people who served in the French resistance more widely celebrated here in Ireland? They're largely unknown bar Samuel Beckett, but his role in the resistance is not why he's famous, and his wartime activity is very much a footnote in a life celebrated for his literary work. I think, I mean, I think it's, it, there's a couple of things going on here. I mean, I think generally they're not well known. I, I mean, I was the first person to actually go into the archives and start pulling the files. And, and, and that may sound like, well, that's not a big deal. But when you consider the amount of people that do research in, in France all the time, and even journalists, who might just say, I'm, I'm curious about Beck and I'll see if there were more. You know, there's that aspect. I think people just don't know about it. There's not a big literature on this, so people don't know. We got a memorial to them in the Irish College in Paris. That, that You know, that's there. I'm sure Irish people look at this all the time and ask the question, who were they? There is a, a small memorial that incorporates them as well in Glass and Evans Cemetery. But there, there hasn't been an awful lot of attention to this. I think this could fall into the, the aspect as well of, I mean, there are, there are difficulties researching in terms of what the records that remain, okay? And it also falls into that difficulty that Ireland ultimately is neutral in World War II. Like, it's a nuanced neutrality, but we are neutral in World War II. And then you've got these people who are kind of in a different country, putting themselves at risk. Are, are we uncomfortable with that idea? I mean, you know, in terms of official recognition in Ireland, you know, was the regime in Ireland at the time kind of uncomfortable with citizens of the country doing this kind of work, getting medals for it from the French and so on and so forth, where, you know, did, did he feel showed up in some way? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But maybe it is just purely, it's the, maybe purely it's the ignorance that people don't know about it. And maybe if other people get into this line of work and researching some of these people, we'll, we'll get more of that and maybe a bit more recognition. Now, next week, we'll stay on the topic of Irish involvement in the French resistance when we discuss the Irish women involved. That's not to be missed, so don't forget to subscribe to the show. I just want to thank David for his time. He'll be back with us again next week. But in the meantime, if you have a relative who fought in the French resistance, David would love to hear from you. His email is in the show notes below. And before I let you go, don't forget to take the survey in the show notes below. That's going to help shape that series on the history of podcasting. And with all that said, 
Until next week, when I'll be back with the story of Irish women in the French resistance, Sloan.